on the other side of the Pacific, you may be tuning in. Uh, my name is Mark Wu. I'm the director of the Fairbank Center for Planning Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome you back for day two of the Rush Hour Lecture uh, featuring Professor Angela Leon KG, who is the Chair Professor of History um, and the Joseph Needham Philip Mao Professor uh, at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, she is joined today by uh, Michael Sony. Uh, who really needs no introduction here, but um, for the sake of formality, uh, he is the Frank Wangshou Wu Memorial Professor in Chinese History and my immediate predecessor as the director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. Um, and so with that, uh, Angela, let me turn it over to you. We're very much looking forward uh, to hearing the story continue about how soy sauce became an everyday food. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to my second lecture. Yesterday, I talked about um, how soy sauce. Um, evolved from an elite, uh, a bit elite, obscure elite food to an everyday food um, after the Berlin And today I will talk more about the um, soy sauce as an everyday food and its, and its uh, power of collecting. So let me begin by reading out a uh, description of soy sauce making. Um, uh, found th this description is reported in in, a, in the compilation that I mentioned yesterday, the Tiao Tiao Ding Ji, um, the Harmonious Cauldron, um, which was a uh, Mid-Qing to early Republican collection of recipes. This um, recipe of uh, soy sauce making shows the extraordinary malleability um, of an indigenous method. Um, in this period, and the, and the author of this uh, recipe is probably someone from Hunan province, a, a southern province. So the text goes, the older the sauce, the better. Some 10-year-old sauces are excellent. A bit of sesame oil added in the fermentation barrel will enhance its aroma. To use a large quantity of soybean in making soy sauce, will create a stronger savory flavor. Um, and sometimes we simply translate it as umami. To use abundant flour will make the sauce sweeter. Northern beans have greater strength, whereas Hunanese beans are weaker. If brewing is done in the sixth month with river water collected in the 12th month, the savory taste, the xian taste, will be enhanced. If the taste of the sauce is not proper, improve it by adding winter frost in the barrel. Brewing under such conditions should last at least 90 clear days from the sixth to the eighth month. For the sauce to reach its flu, uh, uh, it has to be brewed uh, from the sixth to the eighth month uh, for the sauce to reach its full flavor. Arrange six or seven wild aconite roots <coughs> cut into pieces onto the bottom of the barrel to prevent methods. So end of the uh, description of the, of the recipe. This recipe reveals the many possibilities for an artisan working in his specific local ecological context. He could, he could tweak the types and amount of beans, flour, and water used, add aroma enhancer, adjust fermentation timing and duration, and adopt a variety of sanitation techniques, adding um, aconite, for example, is a is a is a frequent uh, is is a, is a frequent practice. The recipe show how food fermentation technology, originally prescribed in standard official agricultural treatises, um, for example, the the recipe that I mentioned yesterday in the um, in the very short 
formula um, uh, recorded by the painter Li Zhan. It's 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 a formula, but there's no. I mean, they, it, there was absolutely no de no such details. Um, the the recipe that I just read out um, uh, show that. Uh, food fermentation technology now evolved, has evolved and gained malleability as the products were increasingly popularized, indigenized, and commodified. By the late imperial period, the emergence of local knowledge in this strong tradition set the stage for soy sauce to play the leading role of an identity food. So, um, my talk today uh, will be in three parts. The, I will first talk about the uh, growth of soy, soy sauce knowledge, local knowledge and practice in the context of China's agronomic tradition, and that um, uh, I situate that change uh, uh, during the change, the, the Ming and Qing change at the uh, uh, mid 17th century. And then I will talk about soy sauce. Uh, soy sauce's taste and place dividing power. Finally, I will talk about soy sauce as a super connector, how it creates commensality and a sense of community, constructing a vision of the modern Chinese nation. So first of all, local knowledge in late imperial agricultural treatises. Indigenous knowledge on and production of soy sauce began to appear in local non-official agricultural treatises, Nong Shu, uh, in the 17th century. These private treatises, ordered mostly by landlord scholars, discussed the techniques simply in the context of farm management, without referring to government administration and state crop concerns. Um, they were shifting gradually from the realm of political agronomy to that of commercial artisanry. When soy sauce became an everyday food and commodity, its various indigenous production um, techniques gained even more visibility in these private agricultural treatises. Uh, one of the most important uh, late imperial Nong Shu um, published in the 1940s, just shortly before the fall of the Ming, written by somebody by the, fame, uh, by the name of Shen, Shen Shi Nong Shu, of the Jianan region typically listed monthly chores for agricultural households. Tasks to be done in the sixth month are described as follow. On clear days, rake the ground and harvest plum beans, mei dou, plant vegetables. Preparatory work includes preparing fish and eggplants to be pickled. Begin soy sauce fermentation. So on a, in a six month, uh, the family should begin to make, uh, to, to ferment uh, soy sauce, he jiang liu. A following section entitled Everyday Consumption at Home, Jia Chang Ri Yong, explains the preparation of foods for daily use. Here I quote, in a six month, as soon as plum, plum beans which is the local soybeans, are harvested, mix them with a ferment, sun the mixture with brine during daytime, and expose it to, to open air at night, which is a standard formula for making soy sauce in, in China. Um, this was followed by instructions for using the resulting sauce to pickle vegetables. Zheng Shi Nong Shu was supplemented in the early Qing by this very famous scholar official, uh, scholar, not scholar official, Zhang Yuxiang. Um, he was, in fact, a main loyalist, a very famous one, um, in the early Qing who gave up his ambition for being to, to become a scholar official and, and became a farmer. He provides more details about the plum beans, Mei Dou used for making local soy sauce. Plum bean, he said, um, are a special breed that grows best in Tongxiang, his native place, where the beans, when the beans are ripe, merchants will come 
and purchase them. So it's a commodity. Both public coffers and private individuals depend on them for the income. So uh, local soybeans um, in the early on, uh, in the uh, in the early Qing in the Jiangnan region, uh, some of them have already become a um, a precious commodity. A contemporary gazetteer of a neighboring county provides extra information about the role of plum beans in the region's economy. It says, merchants arrive and sell them here. They are people's favorite ingredients for making jiang and tofu. These, uh, and, and these uh, mid 17th century texts begin to outline a dynamic regional network of legume cultivation, commodification, and soy sauce making. These treatises and gazetteers from the most prosperous region in, in China tells us something, uh, important things about the popularization of soy sauce and its impact. First, by this time, the agricultural chore of soy sauce making was widely recorded, transmitted, studied, encouraged, and circulated by scholar landlords or scholar officials. Second, Local knowledge involved in soy sauce production was increasingly specific, uh, with a lot of information on, on local, local practices. Third, the value of local soybeans and the food was growing in urbanized regional markets shortly before the massive introduction of Manchurian uh, beans into China proper that I um, discussed yesterday. Soy sauce as an everyday food embedded in agricultural orthodoxy and endowed with local character had already acquired the power to identify a place. So this is a page in uh, Zhang Guixiang's Nong Shu, and the, um, the, the, the words highlighted in blue is Mei Dou. It shows and this text shows that artisans of soy sauce in Qing China had a much greater choice of beans than we might imagine. Soybeans grow everywhere in China, and there is enormous numbers of enormous number of varieties. Today, China claims to have registered more than 20,000 cultivated varieties, domesticated species, and more than 6,000 wild relatives. Certain breeds of local beans seem to have acquired new value after Manchurian beans were massively introduced in China proper after the mid chain as discussed yesterday. As soy sauces became universal, people began to find values in products with a character. And local beans were one of the criteria that people used to distinguish between a gener generic product and something more authentic, defined by its place or locality. By the early 20th century, the volume of Manchurian beans available in China, in China proper, far exceeded local, local breeds. Manchurian beans were also of more uh, even uh, quality. The southern beans, the, some of the, the best were the most expensive, but they were beans which were described as, as inferior compared to the Manchurian ones. So, so the, Manchurian, the Manchurian beans were considered as um, e uh, of good and even quality, but they were not the best for food making. So some of the local beans were the most sought after and expensive soybeans for making soy foods. Um, and were often and, and they would usually have very special local names. In the lower Yangtze region, the plum beans that we have just seen were one, just one example. Another bean is called the du bean, uh, du, uh, the, the, with the, fa the, the family name du, considered as the iconic bean, Mingdou, in the region. According to a, a soybean expert in 1936, <coughs> the types of soybeans produced in Jiangsu province for making jiang are numerous. But the most famous one is the du bean. Manufacturers select among them, among the du beans, 
the particularly fresh, big, regular, dry ones with thin, shiny skins, skin for sauce making. These beans become sticky and emit a pleasant aroma after ste steaming. So they were not value for their productivity, nor for their oil content, but for their special aroma, uh, the special aroma they produce after steaming. The dubin was normally reserved to make the most expensive and perishable soy foods, like bean, bean curds or fermented bean curds. The value of local non manchurian beans towards the Lake Qing is illustrated by the history of a major uh, pickle shop in Ping, in Pinghu, Zhejiang province, uh, called Dingfeng. This is a label of um, the use for products, especially for uh, jiang you can see on the right, and for food, ru fu, of fermented uh, bean curds. And in the middle, in, in, the, in the circle, it shows the prices that won in an exhibition in Southeast Asia. And in the, uh, in the text with the, with the small characters, I highlight um, the name of the soybeans they used to, to make this uh, product, saying that they, the, the pickle shop um, was um, ready to spend a lot of, to, to buy the most expensive beans to make the best products. So around the turn of the 20th century, the shop made its top soy sauce products using a highly sought after bean from Anhui province called Xifu. You can find the word Xifu in the um, blue squares. The shop, um, uh, and, and this, this label um, was designed by a Shanghai printing shop. So a very sophisticated way of labeling their special product, uh, and by highlighting the special bean they use for making the food. During the war with Japan in 1940s, the supply of shifu beans dried up and Manchurian beans were no longer available because of, of the war. So the shop had to rely entirely on the most expensive local two beans to make soy sauce. Uh, two beans and a few other local beans was also lucrative exports to global cities like Shanghai and Hong Kong in the early 20th century. The choice for these local beans was not so much based on their, their oil content, then, but on their juiciness, delicate texture, and fresh and fine taste, criteria used by manufacturers of soy foods. A 1982 catalog of more, almost 7,000 soybean varieties surveyed in China since 1975 shows that of all the 23 provinces, Jiangsu, a leading province in soy sauce making in the modern period, had the greatest share was some 1,200 samples. So the southern beans, um, they are, uh, in terms of quantity, they, 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 are not, they are not comparable with Manchurian beans, but as, as an ingredient for soy foods, they were considered as superior. A few of these were locally known as soybeans, uh, soy sauce beans, jiang yu dou. Some of them are called dou fu dou showing how traditionally the name and value of local soybeans derived, uh, derived, uh, derived from their use in making soy sauces and bean curds. We should note the disagreement between soy sauce, uh, soybean uh, scientists and soy sauce makers on, com on comparative quality of beans. Scientists since the early 20th century have always considered Manchurian beans superior mostly due to their high productivity and emphasize that southern beans need to be improved by crossbreeding with northern beans. Until very recently, um, modern crop scientists are generally not interested in identifying or resurrecting old local, local breeds that were historically well known in the south. Newly engineered local breeds are named mostly by numbers that greatly obscure their use in food making. This trend seems to have downplayed the traditional role of local southern beans 
in branding locality, especially after Manchurian beans, has become a universal lagoon. The great varieties of ingredients and materials available for making soy sauce, um, uh, other than soy sauce, other than soybeans, there there's grain flour, salt, water, and the instrument used like ceramic barrels and so on and so forth. Um, all these, uh, you know, the, the complex process of making soy sauce allow artisans from different locations to tweak their own practice according to local traditions and environment throughout the chain period. With so much scope for flexibility in its preparation, soy sauce was made in a wide range of locations. The availability of Manchurian beans in China proper from the 18th century onwards provided the necessary condition for it to become the universally affordable and accessible common food in the empire, while its plasticity allowed the incorporation of various innovations for producing sources that met different and specific market demands um, uh, and so on. Its malleability soon endowed it with the power of an identity food representing the taste of a social class or of a place, a home, a city, a region, and eventually a nation. So let me go to the second part of my talk. Um, uh, let, let us look at the taste and place defining power of soy sauce. Let us first look at how soy sauce defines elite taste. Soy sauce's role in food preparation was finally given an upfront description in 18th century recipe books. The best known uh, late imperial Chinese recipe book is, I think most scholars would agree, would be this recipe from the Garden of Contentment, Sui Yuan Shidan, um, published in 1792 uh, by, you know, the, um, the very important literatus Yuan Mei of the 18th century. It showcases the leading role of soy sauce as a taste-defining condiment. Yuan Mei, um, a, li a leading literary figure of the Qing, as well as a famous Wu Mei, began the book with a chapter entitled Essential Knowledge. By the way, this book has already has, has an English translation already. Um, so, so the first chapter of the book is called Xu Jidan Essential Knowledge on the, the basic nature of fundamental food materials. The first materials Yuan Mei described in the book were none other than condiments, including soy sauce, chiu, alcohol, oil, and vinegar. For him, soy sauce was, here I quote, like the clothing and jewelry on a woman. And he described in more details. He said, even a woman as beautiful as Xishi, Xishi, of course, was considered the most beautiful woman in Chinese history. Such a beautiful woman, when garbed in ragged and worn coat clothing, would not be presentable. When an experienced cook chooses the condiment, he will buy only that which is made in the heat of summer and prior to using it will taste it to see if it is gan. You can see the word gan, very difficult to translate into English. It is a, it's a kind of sweetness, but it's not a kind of straightforward sweetness. Um, and it's sweet and luscious. Autumn sauce, choyo, uh, you can see it on the slide. Uh, autumn sauce sold in Suzhou is available in superior, medium, and inferior grades. So here, Yuan Mei positioned a specific regional sauce, top quality Suzhou sauce matured after autumn. So it, it began to brew in the summer, and then by the autumn, it, it will be uh, ripe as the benchmark of superior taste. 
This recipe book published in the most cultured and prosperous region in China during the peak of the Qing regime contains more than 300 recipes with some 70 mentions of the best local autumn sauce, autumn soy sauce. This top quality sauce is used for a wide range of dishes. While soy sauce was used in complex meat and seafood dishes cooked with a combination of spices and condiments, it was almost indispensable for simple vegetarian dishes, such as bamboo shoots, considered by the literati elite as one of the most demanding dishes and, and some of the most exquisite ones. So this is um, what I would consider uh, uh, an excellent example of how soy sauce now define elite taste in the chain. But how about popular taste? Again, Tiao Ding Ji, uh, the harmonious cauldron, provides um, probably the best examples of popular taste. This compilation of popular recipes in the later Qing and Republican periods that we have already looked at yesterday is a collection provided by individuals from different walks of life and different regions, scholar writers, chef, pickle shops, uh, chefs, pickle shop or restaurant owners. Um, the book also began with a chapter on condiments, listing various production technologies highlighting the plasticity of a sauce that could be made not only with soybean, but also with other legumes like broad beans, wheat, wheat bran, citron pepper, or rice, etc. The chapter also describes regional soy sauces and a recipe for a durable sauce to be used while traveling. I found this example quite fascinating. This sauce called Qian Li Jiang Yu, um, thousand mile soy sauce, is made with mushrooms immersed in five times their weight in soy sauce and sun until the sauce is, is totally absorbed by the mushrooms. The mushrooms, once dried, could be carried by the traveler to be used for meals during the journey, ensuring that even the most adventurous traveler need not risk going without this essential daily substance. Tiao Ding Ji uh, should be read together with um, this other text, this 48 volume compilation of Qing Bai Lei Chao, um, categorized an anthology of petty matters from the Qing period, first published in 1916 by Xu Ke. Um, Xu Ke, by the way, um, was the editor of Zhang Wu in the early 20th century, commercial press. One of China's first, uh, Xu Ke is, is one, of, one, of, one of modern China's first modern media editors. This huge compilation covers 92 categories relating to everyday life, from weather, animals, plants, to institutions, dialects, religions, customs, emotions, social barriers, and the arts, and ending with three sections on food and drink, featuring popular recipes in which soy sauce is mentioned more than a hundred times. Now, this, this is the volume uh, that contains the three uh, sections on food and drinks. One typical example of using the sauce described in this volume is a pop, as a popular food is the following recipe for simple noodles. When the noodles are boiled, boiled, cooked, splash it with cold water, heat it again and re-splash. While the noodles are still warm, blend with vinegar, garlic, soy sauce, sesame oil, and chai. Add soup and mix. And this is probably one of the best known ways to prepare ordinary noodles. The production and consumption of soy sauce described in this collection were further detached from the Confucian agronomic life world, still described in the early chain, and more fully woven into the web of city life that is also represented in the um, pickle shop phenomenon that I described yesterday. 
On this point, it would be useful to remind ourselves of Fernand Brodel's comment in his classic on material civilization and capitalism, that these infinite small details in the ways of eating and living on different levels are not trivial, they are not insignificant, as they reveal the contrasts and disparities between different societies. They show how a civilization creates and rewires specific links between numerous values and heterogeneous facts, be them economic, political, social, cultural. The prolifer proliferation of new everyday footways being created in urban China around the production and consumption of soy sauce, for example, reveals the profound transformation of economic life, sociality, and cultural identities in cities all of which were rapidly diverging from those of the traditional agricultural cosmic order. Um, so I think it was in that time that a, a kind of a imperial footstep was being shaped. Um, a tayscape on the scale of empire was taking shape in the imagery of late Qing foot writers with inspiration provided by various flavors of regional soy sauces. Qing Bai Li Chao begins to consolidate these regional preferences into a national system of cuisine. Xu Ke, the compiler, deliberately organized his three chapters on food and drink according to an imperial foodscape. He described the various regional dietary characteristics by aromas and flavors. Here I quote, Chuke, the northerners love the taste of scallion and garlic, while people in southwest, in Yunnan, Guizhou, Hunan, Sichuan, cannot do without fiery spices. The Cantonese prefer light foods, while people in Jiangsu have a sweet tooth. In the Jiangnan region, people in Ningguo love fishy taste. Whereas Shaoxing people adore smelly stuff that they eat only after it is thoroughly rotten, <laughs> after decomposition by fermentation. So based on this set of distinctive regional tastes, Xu Ke constructed a national foodscape composed of four culinary traditions represented by 10 leading cities and provinces, Beijing, and Shandong province in the north, Sichuan province in southwest, Jiangning, Suzhou, Zhejiang, uh, uh, Zhenjiang, Yangzhou, and Huai'an in east China, Fujian and Guangdong provinces in the southeast. So four regions. For Xu, people from these regions or cities had tacit understanding of an emotional attachment to the taste of their foods made with specific ingredients and methods. His vision of an emerging national foodscape is to be further elaborated by subsequent food writers. One of them, of course, is Casey Zhang, uh, whose 1977 edited volume, Food in Chinese Culture, is the pioneer work on Chinese food history. <coughs> the first six chapters of this edited volume a chronological covering ancient China to the Qing. And the last two chapters on modern China are split into two parts, one on the north and the other on the south. The imagination of China as an empire or a nation or a modern nation in terms of a composite footscape with regional divisions seem to emerge only in the modern period. So, um, and then other uh, footscapes, other foot maps were constructed um, all the time. And these are just two examples. Mo mo these are modern examples. More recently, the immensely the pobre, and I suppose some of you have seen this, A Bite of China, launched in 2012 by PRC leading official media, CCTV, presents a foot map of China in eight 
major culinary regions. Soy sauce appeared in the first episode of this TV series, described as the fundamental taste-defining condiment of Chinese cuisine. The development of this imagery of differing regional food cultures constituting a coherent whole synchronizes with the growing image of China as a modern nation. Even as it distinguishes classes and regional cultures, food seems to have created strong bonds between different social groups on all levels, bolstering an imagery of a modern China connected by differences. This is particularly true of popular foods with a distinct local taste. The series of Chinese food maps elaborated by food experts throughout the modern period and contemporary, contemporary periods, supposedly to reflect the natural environments and material resources of various regions. I mean, they all claim that, in fact, anticipate rather than document the spatial reality of a nation in the making, indicative of what Benedict and Anderson would call a new state mind within a traditional structure of political power. Foodscapes, like landscapes, are cultural objects through which people experience the nation in their everyday life. It is in this context of continuous foodscape construction since the late Qing that soy sauce became one of the most effective and popular place identifiers and a super connector that sustain a home, bonds a lineage, defines a region, and eventually envisions a modern nation. So, so finally, um, I will talk about soy sauce as an authenticator and a super connector. First of all, it anchors a home. I mean, it, it has always anchored a home. Soy sauce this power as an energy food began at home. Before its rapid commodification in the late 18th century, soy sauce was essentially homemade, mostly manufactured by uh, landlords and scholar, scholar landlords. The example that I show in the Nongshu agricultural treatises in the early Qing uh, is one of the best examples. Um, you know, they prepare the um, uh, foods and soy sauces following family recipes and private agricultural in agric private agricultural treatises. It was a traditional chore for a Confucian family forever attached to a foundational ag agronomic activities. The banye of a scholar is agriculture. So they had to do this agricultural um, uh, practice. The story of the scholar Sun Zhen Lie, a 19th, a 19th century scholar, is revealing. Sun is not a very famous scholar, but um, he's, he was from a scholar landlord family in Wuxi County in Jiangsu province, famous for his records of the Taiping activities in his hometown. He moved to a new lineage compound in his native place in 1878 when he was 36 upon the order of his mother. As soon as he moved in, he noted in his diary, he started to make soy paste and soy sauce, noting the price and amount of yellow soybeans and wheat flour used. For this Confucian scholar, starting the chore of making date everyday soy sauce acted almost like a ritual symbolizing the settling down in a new home. The continent made at home sharpened its power to bond a family or a lineage. The increasing commodification of soy foods in the chain only augmented the power of homemade soy sauce. In his family, in very famous family instructions by Zhang Guoban, this very famous Confucian scholar official who pacified the Taiping Rebellion, wrote in the, early, in, in the early fall of 1866, here I quote, this 
uh, very interesting um, instruction. He said, women in the household should refine their skills in making accompanying foods, jiao cai, like fermented bean curds, soy sauce, pickled vegetables, fine vinegar, and bamboo shoots, etc. They should make these often and send them to me. <laughs> the domestic principles of serving one's parents, uncles, aunts are emphatic on such tasks, but no need to send foods purchased in shops. By indicating the irreplaceable value of condiments and snacks made by younger women of the family, in strengthening bonds between women and men of different generations in the lineage. Zheng Guofan elevated homemade soy sauce as a gift of intimacy. Commercial soy sauce, by contrast, was totally detached from the context of Confucian ethics defined by family chores and thus irrelevant. So, skin new values and power, slightly later in the Republican period, when the traditional Confucian social order cherished by Zheng Guofan and his likes was being increasingly challenged by Western values. And industrialization was becoming a powerful preoccupation of the modern nation. In the 1919 article, in the feminist magazine, Fu Fu Li Zha Zhi, you can see the, uh, the cover of one of the issues that that uh, magazine began in 1915, which was part of this period's new culture movement, promoting Western science and democracy, Western values, women's rights, and all of that to replace Chinese traditional values. Uh, Mrs. Miao, uh, a housewife and a frequent contributor to the magazine, explain why she made soy sauce at home. Mrs. Miao began by criticizing the greediness of pickle shops, which made huge profits by cost cutting. For her, soy sauce sold in shop is the leftovers of that used in pickling. Therefore, its flavor is, not, is no match for homemade ones. She told the readers that my family's ingredients and methods in making soy sauce are different from those sold in shops. We use broad beans instead of soybeans for making soy sauce because they have a sharper skin, umami taste than soybeans. But, but I think the real reason is that broad bean was cheaper than soybeans. She then calculated the total cost of production of soy sauce, which was much lower than purchasing the condiment in shops for the year. Mrs. Miao therefore told her readers, making soy sauce at home was the duty of a diligent and thrifty housewife. Mrs. Miao took great pride in successfully managing a family handicraft by tweaking ingredients, not only to make everyday sauce with a distinct taste that was to save, that was to save money, something that many she said, cultivated women failed to do. On the cover of this book, you, you could see a cultivated woman reading books, but this, that, she is not the model of Mrs. Miao. Mrs. Miao doesn't want to be cultivated, but she wants to uh, have economic contribution to the family. Even, even more, she said, a prudent housewife should help the family make ends meet so that her husband did not need to make extra income by committing fraud or, or taking bribes. Mrs. Miao's story reveals to us new values acquired by homemade soy sauce in this period. First, it represented a genuine local condiment. In addition, making soy sauce at home modernized the traditional Confucian family bonding strategy outlined by Zheng Wofan. Um, in, the 19, in the late 19th century. Modern women make homemade sauce not so much to show respect to their senior male relatives, but to help the husband to be incorruptible breadwinners. These modern housewives' ideal role 
was not to behave like men by being cultivated, which was a goal embraced by more radical feminists of the time, but to transform a traditional masculine agricultural chore in the Nongshu. Such work was men's work, not women's work, uh, into a modern feminist domestic chore with practical benefits to the family, which could re remain fundamentally Confucian in its gender relations. And soy sauce had other uh, connecting um, capability. It can bond the living and the dead. Commercial soy sauce had its own importance as social bonding, um, uh, as a social bonding agent. By the 19th century, it had become a budgeted item for public lineage expenses. Archival materials show that rural and township households were also consumers of commercial soy foods sold mainly in urban centers. Such purchases could be for public events of the lineage, including banquets, weddings, funerals, and ancestor worship. Late Qing family instructions on ancestor worship and tomb sweeping rituals regularly listed soy sauce as one of the four basic food items to be put in small dishes offered to ancestor or dead relatives, along with tea, liquor, and rice in the northern traditions or with vinegar, oil, or pickled foods in the south. The soy sauce used for ritual purposes was mostly purchased in pickled shops with costs shared by the entire lineage. Another use of uh, another uh, 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 connecting function of soy sauce is that it strengthens native place identity. As industrialized soy sauce began to supplant the long and robust tradition of artisanal and agronomic food fermentation in the 1920s and 30s, it created the problem of authenticity for consumers, a problem already raised by Zhang Bofan, who refused to take commercial soy sauce as, as, a, as a gift in the 19th century, and by Mrs. Miao, who, who considered her homemade sauce superior. Commercial sources were criticized for not respecting the season, seasonality of soy sauce making and the timing of daily stirring. A good sauce should be stirred very, very early in the morning, before sunrise, and for cheating consumers by selling inferior products as we have already seen. Only regional sources recognized by their consumers as authentic can create intimate commensality for people from the same native place. Such consumers share a tacit understanding of the taste of home, especially when they are away from home. We can find such examples in various diaries of scholars of the 19th century. A mid 19th century scholar from Tongxiang uh, province by the name of Bi Huai, on his way to the capital to sit for the imperial exam, noted in his diary a particularly memorable dinner he had with a friend featuring a pork stew accompanied by the, by the soy sauce of the native place Tongxiang. Being away from home, he wrote, they were both fully satiated with the taste of home, Huxiang Feng Wei. The commercialization of soy sauce by this time meant that different regional sources were increasingly available, but to identify the authentic ones was a tricky thing. Only those comparable with homemade sources had the power of creating the sense of belonging and the emotion of commensality for people from the same native place. Uh, Qing Soy sauce had another uh, power, and that is to bind an imperial world order. Soy sauce's bounding power was also applied in Qing diplomacy. It became a major food, major food item listed in China's diplomatic convention from the 18th century onward. It was a must in the standard daily provisions 
for foreign envoys, ambassadors and translators visiting China, foreign diplomats and their translators from Europe and neighboring tributary states receive daily provisions of about 100 to 300 grams of soy sauce, together with different kinds of meats, fish, noodles, wine, tofu, pickled vegetables, vinegar, and sesame oil. These were used in the first half of the 19th century to showcase Chinese hospitality. However, we do not know where and how this diplomatic sauce was made. I wish somebody could find out. And whether it represented a certain regional taste, or if the Qing authorities were conscious of providing a condiment that, representing, that represented a Chinese taste. Uh, this I, I do not know. But finally, soy sauce is significant in, um, in its role in, uh, to ambition a modern China. The popularization of soy sauce was contemporary with the emergence of Chinese modern nationalism from the 19th century onward. The continent as a common everyday food was by then, as we have seen, effective in producing a sense of identity and commonality on different levels. It had also become an urban commodity of significant economic value, representing a vibrant urban lifestyle shared by people of different social classes. With the wide commodification of Manchurian soybeans, Manchuria was now seen as an integral part of cultural China. Such imagery seemed to have prepared the development of a certain vision of China as a modern nation in the sense of Anderson's imagined communities when the empire was increasingly challenged by the West. Craig Calhoun's notion of everyday nationalism is particularly relevant to our story here as the experience of the sharing of traditional popular foods was so deeply embedded in people's daily lives and emotions that the emerging national sense of belonging easily became available for politics. Soy sauce as a popular food was indeed amongst the primary cultural objects into, into which connotations of nationalist sentiment are woven, as Catherine Palmer argues. When Mrs. Miao advocated how homemade sauce, sauce in 1919, she assumed the role of a modern housewife in an emerging modern nation, and at the same time, that of a defender of, a tradi of traditional values against greedy modern industrialists, now seen as a liability for the new regime. The inconsistencies and contradictions in everyday experiences and knowledges root by emotion and effect rather than formal logic were easily translated into the Im imagery of the struggling modern Chinese nation. Such complex nationalist sentiment was almost explicitly, explicitly expressed in Xu Ke's Qing Bai Lei Chao that we have already mentioned. This compilation was conceived with the Western other as the back of Xu Ke's mind. He began the section on food and drink with general discussions on the importance of food by comparing different national diets. When he compared the grain-based Chinese diet with the Western meat-based one, he inevitably He said, how could our countrymen eat the same food as the Europeans and Americans? But aren't we all concerned that we will never be as strong and as prosperous? Western nutritional science was highlighting the necessity of animal protein in the diet for the physical and intellectual well-being of a race or nation, leading Xu Ke to regret the lack of meat in the most vegetarian Chinese diet. For him, vegetarian cuisine no longer represented elite taste as in the Ming uh, and Song and the Ming periods. 
but it was rather a reason for the economic backwardness and overall weakness of the Chinese nation. And yet, in the passage on how Westerners view our diet, there's a section on that, he proudly noted that, here I quote, very interesting um, opinions of his. Westerners consider that there are three major dietary traditions in the world. The first one is that of our country, Japan and Europe. Chinese food is said to be good for the mouth as the taste is distinguishable. Japanese food is good for the eye as the decoration is pleasing. European food is good for the nose as the aroma coming out from cooking is nice. Does this mean that, does this mean that in fact, Chinese food is best in the world? Food practices were indeed effective in expressing the contradictions in modern nationalist imageries. For Xu Ke, another nationalist reformist, although Chinese traditional foods may be universally considered delicious and unique, they were not always the best for the nation's physical health. Soy sauce, as the leading taste defining condiment, was one of the best illustrations of this very interesting contradiction. The thread that goes through passages in this volume of um, this section on food and drink in Xu Ke's work is the idea of Gai Liang improving, how to improve Chinese food and diet. Here, the unscientific artisanal tradition in food making became the target of attack. A long paragraph provided by a lady from Wuxi who had studied Western cuisine in the US suggested ways to improve banquet dishes in China. Besides cutting down the number of dishes, which she thought was excessive, she, recommend, she recommended using lard to replace soy sauce for cooking traditional vegetarian dishes, such as bamboo shoots and green vegetables. She advised, here I quote, even though soy sauce is vegetal and not harmful to health, it would still be better not to consume too much. A reaction probably triggered by the growing suspicion, increasing common not, uh, uh, suspicion increasingly common among the educated elite of the way Chinese soy sauce was commercially produced. We already saw the opinion of Mrs. Miao on this. That production, based on the uncodified artisanal way of producing soy sauce through traditional craft, was increasingly viewed as incompatible with the emerging modern Chinese nation. It was criticized as unscientific and unhygienic embodying the shameful backward aspects of Chinese culture. Soy sauce's very plasticity, implying the lack of standard procedures for production and the absence of scientific standards to measure its quality, only further marred its image as a popular food. To improve to Gai Liang, the Chinese way of food making and consumption with Western and Japanese science, science and technology, thus became one of the most urgent tasks for modern China. And how the first Chinese food scientists try to remake soy sauce to fit the modern China they envision will be the topic of my next lecture. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, uh, first of all, to Angela for that stimulating and wide ranging and provocative uh, set of remarks. Um, I'm also going to uh, exercise my privilege to thank everyone involved uh, in the Fairbanks Center uh, for making this long delayed and long awaited lecture possible. Um, and I'd also like to thank Mark and Dan actually for, for being gracious enough to include me in this event that uh, that we planned. Uh, together three years ago or four years ago and is now finally happening. Um, 
So um, as, uh, as some of you here will know, I've long had a kind of back burner project of, of writing a, a uh, historically inflected ethnography of a Chinese supermarket. Um, and so I also want to thank Angela for the opportunity. This was, um, of course, I do research on this project um, every time I go shopping. But when I was asked to, given the commission of being discussant, this was the first formal field work that I did. Um, I went to the supermarket and looked around. And actually what I found was, was actually to me very surprising and unexpected. And I don't know if you found the same, but the locally inflected and locally local representation of soy sauce um, has completely disappeared. Um, I, the Fairbanks Center was not able to fund my trip to China this weekend, but I think that what I found at Super 88 in Medford is actually probably true. I asked a few friends in China, probably true in a Chinese supermarket as well. Um, the local representation and the, the role of soy sauce in local identity has been displaced by uh, commodification and differentiation on different grounds, brand and quality. And I think this is, this. I found this really interesting because this is actually not true of all the products that are central to Chinese cuisine. It's not, for example, true of alcohol, which continues to be differentiated locally very strongly. And so this makes me think, and I, perhaps we'll hear about this tomorrow, but I think in terms of the larger framing of the story, it's really interesting that this is an interrupted or a discontinuous history. And why that should be is a really interesting question. I'm gonna focus on, as I think the, the role of a discussant ought to be, I'm gonna focus on four ways in which I think we can situate, or four ways in which one might situate this wonderful project more broadly. And so really, rather than posing specific questions, I would just like to invite your reaction to the, 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 the linkages that I'm gonna propose. Um, I'm gonna propose um, to situate what we heard today in terms of locality, in terms of spatiality, in terms of modernity, and sadly, there's no iffy word for globalization. Um, otherwise, I would have had a perfect formulation. Then I'm gonna close with a couple of ironic observations about the story of soy sauce. So let's start with um, locality. Um, so, um, in the first part of your talk, you, you gave us that lovely detailed account of the recipe of how you make soy sauce. And I had the written text, of course, or to my advantage, which you did not. But there's a, con there's a clear contrast between this Qing, highly detailed, highly specific account and the kind of generic earlier, earliest accounts that you gave us. I've forgotten from, from which text. And so you could tell this story um, of, of the increasing complexity and increasing differentiation as a story of um, commercial development, which is part of the story that you told. You could tell it as a story of um, uh, specialization. You could tell it as a story of technology, also part of your, of your story. But you could also tell it as a story, uh, and this is also, I'm not suggesting that you didn't say talk about it in this way, but you could also tell it as a story of locality and a, a story that fits into a longer story of the history of local identity. Now, there's an ongoing tension in Chinese history uh, between the idea of a shared identity that transcends locality and the strength of local attachments and identities. Um, so Victor, um, I'm going to follow Victor's, Victor referenced Professor Elliot yesterday. I'm going to continue the tradition of Harvard log rolling. Um, I learned, uh, I learned about this historical discourse, mostly from Peter Bowl, who's not here today, unfortunately, uh, but I'm sure word will get back to him about, about this log rolling. Um, in a 2002 article called Lo The Localist Turn and Local Identity in Late Imperial China. And there, Peter makes the argument that we can identify two cycles in this tension between local and translocal identifications. One in the Song, and he writes that in the Song, the nation began to exist as a collection of localities 
and the commonalities which gave the location, gave the nation its cultural identity were instantiated in the shared categories that were used to define the locality. Peter contrasts this discourse of local identity with a late Ming discourse, which he talks about as being a discourse of difference rather than sameness. So unlike a Song discourse, which highlights the ways in which my locality does things properly in the proper way, like other localities, the Ming discourse, Peter argues, is, is, is um, about difference. It is, to quote, a discourse in a time when there is no single authority that everyone could appeal to, nor any perceived need to reach a coherent and inclusive ideological formulation. And then in a kind of extraordinary premonition of today's, of today's talk, Peter suggests that we can think about Song identity discourse he analogizes it to talk, talk about funerals, where everyone should do funerals in the same way, and we do in my locality, and the main discourse, which he says we can analogize to a conversation about food. Peter claims to have no memory of writing this passage, uh, but anyways. Um, the, the, um, so the point I'm trying to make, of course, here is that in this larger argument about local identity, the consciousness of the local in the late Ming extends to a kind of local food connoisseurship. And in other words, the, the main point I want to make, and this is the, the, the first linkage, is that the story of soy can also be situated in a broader conversation, a broader intellectual and cultural shift about ideas of the local. And I think your narrative fits perfectly in relation to that larger intellectual, that broader intellectual shift. Spatiality, what are the spatial patterns on which local identity developed? Um, so the second part of your talk, you describe this emerging vision of a imperial national foodscape, and you gave this lovely quotation from Xuke about, about from the, the, the uh, Qingbai Lei Chao about the contours of that, of that national foodscape. I have to say, when I looked at your maps as someone who's interested in contemporary China, I really want to know what the foodscape of the nine dashed line is. I found that kind of an extraordinary map that, that uh, even, the, even, even in the map of foodscapes, we have to have the nine dashed line. But anyways, that's not the, that's not the point I want to make. Um, so she could tells us, and I've just done a very, very quick mapping of Xu Ke's four categories. Beijing, Shandong, Sichuan, Jiangnan. Well, he doesn't call it Jiangnan, but basically it's Jiangnan and Fujian and Guangdong. Um, and this is then elaborated into eight in, in, uh, in the Bight of China. But um, here's a map that all my students know, which is the map of Skinner's macro regions of China. And it's kind of cool, isn't it? That uh, Xu Ke's four, four categories map almost perfectly onto four of Skinner's eight macro regions. It's actually, of course, when you stop and think about it, not at all surprising, because what was the significance of macro regions? They defined economic networks. They defined the reach of regional economic uh, of, of marketing. But even more interesting, I think, is something that Skinner only ever hinted at. But with, so Skinner, Skinner, um, argued that, that the significance of the macro regions was not just in terms of marketing, but that social and cultural and intellectual patterns mirrored those economic patterns, which is why he's been criticized sometimes as a, as a geographic determinist by way of being an economic determinist. And one of the things that he just hinted at, never really explored in much detail, but other scholars have, I'm drawing a blank on, on, on who's done this, but other scholars have argued, so Skinner hits at among the um, social patterns that are going to follow the macro regional contours is marriage networks. The brides are going to be taken from within a common subregion, and elite brides are going to be taken from within a broader region, but still within the larger macro region. And of course, you see, you see where I'm, I'm, I'm going with this. How are foodways transmitted? How do foodways move from place to place? One of the ways they move from place to place 
is through intermarriage. And so the argument I'm trying to make here is that um, Skinner, Skinner also works for food waste. Um, now, the first part of your talk was all about the, um, the story before the massive introduction of beans from Manchuria. And um, the, 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 which is really a sort of early globalization story because, um, and that brings me to my third, uh, my third linkage. Um, I was, I was, as I was, as I was sort of reading around this area, I read uh, David Wolf's Been There Towards a Soy-Based History of Northeast Asia, which wins, of course, the all-time, all-time award for low-hanging fruit in academic puns, or in puns in academic titles. Um, you, you can't get much more, you can't get much lower than this. But anyways, um, and, and so, so Wolf explains the geopolitical background to the expansion in Manchurian soybean production that you that, that is in the background of your story. And he talks about it, of course, uh, you can imagine, as the product of geopolitical competition of the first Manchurian, um, the first, so you talk about the two, the two waves of migration, the first one being a, uh, a migration rooted in chain fiscal concerns, and the second one, uh, basically a, an attempt to, a, a 19th century, early 20th century attempt to respond to pressure from Russia and pressure from Japan. And that's, of course, what gives rise to the, that's the geopolitical background to the ubiquitousness of soy sauce that is the theme of your third, the third part of your, of your talk. Um, one of the things that becomes, so I did a little, uh, I followed up a little bit more and learned that the um, story of the soybean in Manchuria um, is actually, this is a, this is a, an account of Manchuria by uh, uh, Adachi Kanosoki. I don't know if this is a well-known work, uh, but it's cited by, uh, it's cited by Wolf. So I followed it up and it tells us that um, uh, this, these are a couple of accounts of soybeans in his work. This tells us, first of all, that the soybean spread is a romantic story. It is an eloquent story of which we have only told not one half of one hundredth. So plenty of room for your book, because <laughs> as, of the, as of this earlier phase, but it's also a story of how the soybean spreads around Asia and around the world in a way that is modest and unassuming. And it struck me that this curious anthropomorphism of the soybean is, is not something, I don't think something we would find in the Chinese language materials. But he does, I think, anticipate in kind of curious ways the contemporary expansion of historical agents, of historical agency. That is to say, thinking more broadly, I see, I see my students nodding because we talk about this a lot in my class. Um, the idea that, that um, non-sentient beings can be considered historical agents is a really interesting idea. And so let me humbly suggest that I'll be very disappointed, Angela, if nowhere in the book is there a section title following the great tradition of Spivak and, and, and Mitchell, if there's nowhere in your book a section called, Can the Soybean Speak? <laughs> so I hope that I hope that somewhere that will that will make it in. Um, it's in the context of I'll, I'll close shortly. It's in the context of this of this of uh, uh, 19th century expansion, the growing ubiquitousness of uh, soybean that that of soy sauce that other values get attached to soy. New values get attached. This you refer to in your in the last part of your talk today, um, where soy sauce becomes implicated in conversations about about modernity. And what we see is um, the emergence of soy sauce. I mean, here I'm just summarizing a soy sauce as a symbol of authenticity and simultaneously a symbol of backwardness. And that was really where you, where you concluded today. I, I wish Peter were here because I wonder if this is the pos this represents the possibility of a third cycle of local identity, a new discourse of local identity, which is simultaneously uh, 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 valued for being authentic, but problematic for being backwards. 
Um, let me close with uh, two ironies that I think emerge from your, your presentation today. Um, once soy sauce becomes ubiquitous, it has to be used in funerals and it has to be, and it's a, it becomes an object of, of mass consumption. Um, and so the, the, the first irony is, is the irony that we know about soy through the writings of elites. And um, the poor who consumed the soy sauce, well, the poor who raised the beans that made the soy sauce, and the poor who consumed the soy sauce, they would not have cared about um, issues of local identity, and issues of local represent representativeness, I feel quite confident that what they would have cared about is the way soy, soy sauce and other products made from soy would relieve the monotony of the extraordinarily monotonous diet of ordinary Chinese peasants through history. Um, the, the, uh, and, and, uh, you know, this is this is comes through as such a strong theme when we talk to elderly Chinese people, wherever they come from. Um, the the that's the that's the that's the uh, that's the significance of soy for ordinary Chinese people through history or soy sauce. And then the second irony um, is, I know people were probably expecting what I was going to say about the authors. We know about we know about soy sauce almost entirely from the writings, not just of, of, of one particular kind of elite. We know about it from the writing of, of men, male elites. Um, the uh, women first make an appearance in this story uh, in Zhang Fan's comments to to his family members. Um, I guess I could be wrong, but I guess that prior to commercialization, women made soy sauce and men wrote about it. Uh, and there are all kinds of parallels in, in the way foodways are transmitted in our culture uh, as well. Now, it's possible that I'm wrong. It's possible that, that, that making soy sauce really is a masculine agricultural chore up until the Ming or the Qing or, or whenever. It, it may be that I'm projecting my own 21st century bourgeois sensibilities back on the past, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I think uh, I think um, we've already as I've already talked about um, a hypothesis about the role of marriage networks in spreading food ways. Um, I, sus I suspect that my my hypothesis that women made soy and men talked about women making soy and wrote about women making soy is is correct. But even if it's wrong, there's a there's a there's a further sort of irony if we bring if we frame the story in terms of women, which I think you hint at in your in your in your presentation. But but I think is bears is worth dwelling on in in, in more detail, and that is that the ubiquitousness of soy sauce in the 20th century at a moment of national crisis, turns soy sauce production into, into a domestic chore, right? into a chore that is a job that is definitely for women to do, and forces upon these women makers of soy the burden of both um, upholding family values and being responsible for backwardness. Right, a very familiar uh, burden that is placed upon women in many parts of the world in the in the twentieth century. Okay, it's time for me to stop. the The displacement of the traditional and artisanal with the industrial and the and the commodity, of course, fits into a larger history of twentieth century China. The rejection of existing ways in favor of universal the universal modern. Um, in some aspects, the rejection of the artisanal and the respect, the rejection of the traditional and the rejection of the metis, uh, th this has been a tragic story. Um, I'm not sure that uh, soy sauce um, will reach, the story of soy sauce will reach the level of tragedy, but it's certainly part of the same story. And I'm looking forward to hearing you tell the next chapter tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Michael, for this wonderful um, comments. Uh, you you raised a lot of points, and and you know I'm I'm an, I'm not a fast thinker. I'll, I'll take some. And you have jet lag. Yeah, well, jet lag is better today. Good. Yeah. So, but I need time to digest and think. But I I want to react um, immediately to the, one of the last points that you made, and that is 
on uh, whether women make sauce and uh, make the sauce and then men wrote about it. It's not exactly that. I, um, because, because fermentation as a, as a technology has long been considered a male work because women is a polluting oh. person. So since the, the, since the earliest um, agricultural treatise, the Qi uh, Yao Shu, it's very specific that okay. women should not take place, should, should not um, uh, involve, be involved in, in the fermentation work because they pollute, especially pregnant women. Mm -hmm. So, so um, women making soy sauce at home is relatively late. So until the, um, up till the late Ming and early Qing agri uh, uh, um, ag agricultural treatises, uh, I mean, they don't specify whether the, the person who made the sauce was men or women, but, but the reader would presume that it's the men who did the work. These are, fermentation work is basically a, a, a male. And if you go, I, I interview um, uh, uh, soy sauce manufacturers in, in, um, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, uh, these family businesses, and sometimes they um, uh, employ uh, workers doing the job and most, and they are all men. Hmm. And one, one worker, uh, specifically, he told me that um, women were not allowed in the fermentation room. So, so making soy sauce in the 20th century, Mrs. Miao, uh, it's it's really a new new modern thing that they the women make the sauce at home, and that is something new. And I don't know, um, but of course, after the 20th century. Um, it's uh, it's more common that women make sauce at home. I mean, this this uh, taboo of forbidding women making sauce has gradually dis disappeared. Right. So that is Thank the you. last point that I would like to make. Um, but I think in um, in Taiwan uh, in Taiwan even today, uh, I visited quite a few um, uh, artisanal makers. The majority were men, young men. And only a couple, um, you know, the, the wives or the or the daughters were involved, but the majority were male. I think there's still the, the taboo still remains more or less. It's, I mean it's not absolute right now. So Great. thank you. <laughs> well, I can, uh, collect the questions and anyone who has questions, and then Angela will ask you to respond uh, after I Yes, to collect. So, if you have a question, if you don't mind raising your hand. Yeah. And so, I saw one hand. Is there anyone else with a question? Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for a uh, very insightful and stimulating lecture uh, yesterday and today. I'm from Okoshiroyama University of Tokyo and have a Yinchin Institute. Uh, maybe uh, following the last uh, comments and question. Uh, I'd like to ask about the uh, organization and institution of production and marketing of uh, soy sauce. Uh, let, uh, yesterday, you sh you showed uh, the pictures of Changfan, uh, right, uh, in Shanghai and Beijing, and uh, and also uh, you uh, emphasize the commercialization or com or, or or you know marketization of. Uh, soy sauce from um, Qing. So I just wonder, you know, who who took care of those, you know, organization? Like, where did money from, and how how those, you know, uh, managers or you know the owners are uh, recruited or cultivated artisans or things like that? Uh, I'm asking this question as far as I know. For example, in Japan, right. Like still now, there are several family run, you know, uh, show you soy sauce producers, and you know they remain pretty much um, uh, dominant in local market and still there from other periods. So they are ma mainly uh, family business. So I wonder if if there is any comparison or difference, or if you have any idea in their uh, organization institution. Historical perspective. Uh, if I could learn, you would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I think it depends on the period. 
uh, we're talking about uh, the the Jiang Fang the the Qing Jiang Fang they um, most of them are family businesses, um, but the bigger ones they 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 um, also employ workers, and um, the workers usually are from um, nearby rural villages, and they were recommended uh, by the relatives of the owners um, to work as um, workers. So, so the owners were, they belonged to the same family, but the workers uh, were from outside. So these are, these are the biggest, the, the, the structure of the biggest um, manufacturers, but you have smaller ones that, that involve only family members. And um, today, when you look at um, cases in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, it's basically similar that the, 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 business, the business is owned by the family and the family members are involved more or less, but um, the major chores, the hard work is by workers employed by them. But, but of course, now the, the workers, they, they just recruited workers in whatever way they can. I mean, they are not recommended by relatives. I mean, this 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 is the way when uh, this is the way that um, Qing um, uh, pickle shops function. Um, so so I, I don't know whether I answer your question. Please join me in thanking Professor Ron and welcome everyone to this session following in the conference. Sure, will be tomorrow uh, uh, at 4.30. Uh, Mark, it will, uh, it will be in the Belfer case study room, not in this room, so the room next to me. Thank you, everyone. Which is